Here we're going to take a look around the outside and then the inside of the Avro Vulcan that's on display at the Newark Air Museum. The museum is located on the former RAF Winthorpe, which was a second World War airfield built near Newark in 1940 as a satellite station to RAF Swinderby. It was a bomber command station that was intended to be used by Polish bomber squadrons operating the ferry battle. In October of that year, the pesky Luftwaffe dropped a single parachute mine onto the airfield which left a crater on the grass runway. The grass airfield was briefly used by Hanley Page Hamptons in 1941 and then in 1942, three large concrete runways were built for the Avro Manchester and the Avro Lancasters that would operate from the base. Following the end of the war, the airfield would become a satellite station to RAF Syston where Halifax bombers, Dakotas and Oxfords were operated. In 1978, the Newark Air Museum was opened on the base and remains there until this day with a large selection of different aircraft types. So let's have a talk about the Vulcan. The Vulcan was built by Woodford-based manufacturer Avro and was developed in response to the British government's requirement to build a long-range jet aircraft that was capable of carrying nuclear weapons as part of the United Kingdom's nuclear deterrent. This led to the production of the famous V-bombers, the first of which was the Vickers Valiant which first flew in 1951. Next on the scene was the Avro Vulcan which first flew in 1952, followed by the Hanley Page Victor which first flew four months later. Short Brothers and Harland of Belfast also built two prototypes to compete with the tender and built the Short Sperrin, which was a four-engine, jet-powered bomber that first flew in 1951. If you get a chance, have a Google about the Sperrin, as it's quite an interesting looking aircraft. Instead of the engines being incorporated into the aircraft's wing like with the Vulcan, or below the wing like with the Boeing 737, its engines were mounted on top of each other, protruding both above and below the aircraft's wing. Given the large size of the Vulcan, the interior is actually quite small and there's only a gap of about 19 centimetres that separates the pilot from the co-pilot. Given the need to protect the crew from a nuclear flash following the detonation of an atomic bomb, there aren't very many windows inside and the ones that are there are quite small. Only the pilot and the co-pilot were lucky enough to be fitted with an ejection seat and the crew in the back had to escape by parachute down the hatch you just saw me climb up. It was reported that they could potentially encounter difficulties bailing out if the landing gear was down, so they were told to try and grab one of the hatch struts on the way down to try and prevent themselves from hitting the nose gear on the way down. What I find really fascinating about the Vulcan is just how ahead of its time it was. Just consider, the Vulcan flew just 10 years after the first flight of the Avro Lancaster and just 36 years after the first flight of the World War I biplane bomber, the Hanley Page Hayford. Now just have a think about that. 36 years ago for us was when Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up and George Michael's Faith were released. It really was a huge technological leap for such a short time period. The Vulcan became famous for taking part in the 1982 Operation Black Book, which involved Vulcans attacking Argentinian positions on the Falkland Islands during the Falklands conflict. This involved flying the Vulcan for over 6,000 nautical miles in 16 hours from the Ascension Islands in the Atlantic, which involved refueling the aircraft several times mid-flight from escorting Handley Page Victor tankers. 